Hi, and welcome back. In this chapter, we're going to be covering security assessment and testing from the CISSP Chapter 15. If you're following along with our course, we're at the end of our software assurance section. This will finish out our risk management, vulnerability, disaster recovery, access control, and then finally end up with our vulnerability testing and assessments. Let's get started. So it's important in any company that you want to protect that you build a security assessment and testing program. The program part of it means that it needs to be documented, it needs to have some organization to it, and it needs to be followed with some sort of periodic um, consistency. You aren't just doing this once and putting it away, you are doing this consistently throughout the lifetime of your company. Testing is going to be used to make sure that the controls are functioning. Remember when we talked in business continuity plan, we understand um, what the important priorities are for our company. When we talked about access control, we understood that we were implementing controls to protect access. Security testing ensures that those controls are functioning appropriately. Are we putting controls in place that are actually doing what we think they're going to do? We have to test that to make sure. Testing can consist of automated scans or pen testing, penetration testing, or even manual attempts where um, a user can actually go in and manually attempt to break into the system and see what happens. So if you, as a security analyst, are going to attempt to break into your company and find out if those controls work and if you are able to actually breach the company and get access to data. It's important that your security testing occur on a regular schedule. It, it can be somewhat varied, you know, as long as you do it once a month or once every six months, make sure that you continually test and that you test consistently on that schedule. Again, it's very easy to put this off and say, I'm going to do it next time, or I'm going to do it next month, or I'm going to do it next year, and then you end up not doing it at all. Make sure you have it documented. This is what the schedule is going to be. However, testing has risks associated with it what availability or criticality is going to be affected by those tests. If you do break in, is it going to cause failures or any risks of you breaking in? And what is the actual business impact of those tests? Are they adding additional load, which is going to make your business go down um, or slow, in which case you might want to schedule those in the evenings or on weekends when the load is a little bit less. So you want to take all of these into account while you're building your testing program. Security assessments is simply the comprehensive review of your security. Figure out your risk assessments. Remember where we figure out the threat and the asset that's being attacked. And then we identify the vulnerabilities. Remember, a vulnerability can be any weakness. It can be any flaw, limitation, something that makes it so that that asset is now at risk from that threat. The security assessment will create an artifact, essentially called the assessment report, which will document all of the things that you have learned through your training and through your assessment um, and your penetration testing of your system. The NIST program, 800, uh, special publication 853A, goes through and describes the different things that need to be included in your security assessment. The four basic ones are the documentations that needs to be in there, the controls that are in your system, the actions that are carried out by your people, and then who those people are. So the individuals, activities, mechanisms, and specifications. I recommend going through and reading the special publication 853A to make sure that you understand the requirements for a security assessment. A large part of cybersecurity or cybersecurity analyst is going to be creating these artifacts. So an assessment report of where are the vulnerabilities in your actual system. Every time that you do any type of an assessment or a testing, it is important to have the whole thing audited. Audited or auditing is generally performed by an impartial, unbiased person. You don't want to have your software developers doing the auditing. You don't want to have your software development team doing the auditing. You don't want to have payroll auditing themselves. You don't audit yourself. You bring in a third party and that third party is usually someone who is unbiased and impartial. They are going to see things that you're not going to see. If you've ever written a paper and you recognize that when you write the paper, you think the spelling is fine, and you hand it off to a friend and he says, you know, you have 12 spelling errors here. You didn't notice it because it was your paper and you saw what you thought you wanted to see as opposed to what was actually there. Bringing in an impartial person who doesn't have a, a stake in the game is going to be a little bit less biased about whether there are any issues. 
generally security audits are created rather than for the development team to build the system. They're going to be for your board of directors or perhaps your regulators, your government regulators, to make sure that you are following all of the compliance requirements for your industry. There are three different levels of third-party audits. The first is a, is a um, SOC 1, which is designed to improve the accuracy of the financial reporting. It is all about finances, making sure that the numbers balance. SOC 2 is generally for internal viewing. It is not designed for the general public. So this is something that we can use internally to make sure that our system is getting better and that we're doing things correctly. And finally, our SOC 3 is designed to improve security, but it's for public viewing. It's for people to understand what the security is that we're doing because we actually want them to know. We want them to know what we're doing to make sure that our company is safe. We also have two different types on top of the SOC levels of a type 1, which is a specific point in time. Today, this month, we are going to be doing security as of this month and seeing what the status is right now. A specific point in time as opposed to type 2 which is more of a historical information over a period of time we can use type 2 to show that we have increased our security platform over time that we have decreased the number of attacks that our security platform is working when we look at security audits we generally follow either the COBIT or the ISO standards COBIT standing for the control objectives for information and related technologies and then the ISO 27000 one and two, which describe the security audit requirements necessary for systems like this. Remember, audits can always be of different types. You can have an internal audit. The people in your company are going to audit. You might have an audit team as part of your company. Um, so those are called internal. Everybody is internal. They are all part of the team. They are all part of the company. They understand that the company's best interest is at heart. External can be auditing by an outside firm. This is where you pick one of the main firms, there's a few of them, that are known for their ability to do security audits. They will come in as an unbiased, impartial person and audit your company, perhaps for SEC regulations or, um, or for, for information to be handed over to companies that are interested or shareholders. For some reason, you're bringing in an external audit to make sure that there's no corruption from anybody internal, you bring an external team in. Third-party audits are generally conducted for another organization. External audits are still designed for the company, but third-party are perhaps for the government or, again, SEC regulations or um, SOC analysts or something along those lines. Um, you want to make sure that the third-party is to make sure that you are in compliance with all of the rules or perhaps another organization um, has requested it. So a third party audit is not going to go back to your company. It's going to go to somebody outside of your company, whereas both an internal and an external are actually going to be absorbed by your company. So recognizing where does the audit end up and what, who is the person that is designed for um, can help you differentiate between internal and external designed for the company itself, as opposed to third party, which is designed for someone else. So now we need to start working on our vulnerability assessments. The purpose of a vulnerability assessment is to describe the vulnerabilities. Remember, a vulnerability is any weakness or limitation or flaw in your system. NIST has created what they call their SCAP, uh, Security Content Automation Protocol, which follows a couple of different um, concepts. So they're listed out here. They're usually referred to by their acronym. So recognizing the acronym is going to be really important for the CISSP exam. So the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures describes the vulnerabilities. So the vulnerabilities themselves, you can go into the CVE and each one of the vulnerabilities that's been identified has a number and a description of what that vulnerability is. So Apache, this version has an opening where someone can break in and do such and such. Um, so the vulnerabilities and exposures, the CVE list, it's a very important list for you to be able to be aware of. When you reference the CVE, you can go through and figure out how to fix those vulnerabilities. The scoring system describes how to score a vulnerability based on how much impact it has. If the entire impact is they can read, but they can't write, they can't change anything, the impact might be a little bit lower. I mean, it's it's out there so they can read it, but they can't change anything, changes the scoring. Um, you can also have how much of an impact is it. Yes, they can get in, but they can't do anything once they get there. Um, configuration and numeration. So the common configuration and numeration refers to configuration issues. 
platform enumeration refers to the operating system or the application or the devices. So which platform? Is it working on Microsoft? Is it working on Windows? Um, or is it working on Apple or Linux? Is it working on this application or that? Um, so the enumerations or the breakdown based by platform is from the CPE, platform enumeration. We also have the Extensible Configuration Checklist Description Format, which is a language. It's XCCDF, which is a language for our checklist. It's a way that we describe it so that it can be automated and give you the answers you want following a basic language. And the last one is our Open Vulnerability and Assessment Language, or OVAL, which is the language for procedures. So as opposed to checklists, it's the one that we use for procedures. When you are doing vulnerability assessments, you need to follow the basic workflow of detect something, Validate it, ensure that it actually is there. So we found something, but did you really? Let's go make sure that we actually found it. Validation. And then once we have confirmed that it's really there, now we remediate it. We do something to fix it. So every time you find a vulnerability, you want to follow these three steps. Detection, validation, and then remediation. So a vulnerability scan is designed to automatically probe your system or your application or your network looking for weaknesses. And we break our vulnerability scans into four different categories. The first is network discovery. Second, vulnerability. Third is specifically web application vulnerability. And the last is databases. Remember, the attackers, the hackers, the crackers, they are all going to use the same tools that we do. So using those tools, realize anything that we see, they can see. So if I look in there and I do a network discovery and I see all of my ports that are open, so can anybody else who can get into my system and can look at that discovery. So always be aware that they use the same tools we do, which means the tools we are going to use could be considered the tools that the hackers use. However, just like a locksmith, locksmith who is being paid to come in and break into your house uses the exact same tools that a burglar does to break into your house. So if he can break in, so can a burglar. So let's describe each of these categories individually. Starting with network discovery. Network discovery generally uses a concept called, or a tool called Nmap. Um, you need to get comfortable with Nmap. It's, it's a tool that is used extensively through this degree program and through um, any of the, jo the jobs that you're going to be doing in this career. The purpose of Nmap is to scan a range of IP addresses looking for an open port. So it runs, and the results generally include open, closed, or filtered. So we can look through the, the individual ports and see in the example down here that port 80 is open and it runs an HTTP service. And 515 is open and it's running a printer. We have an HTTP proxy at 8080. We have Jet Direct running at 9100. We can also tell if it's TCP or UDP. When we run the network discovery, we can do this type of, of, of port lookup to find out which ports are open. Knowing which ports are open can tell us where some vulnerabilities might be. If I know a vulnerability that's attached to the Jet Direct program, then I can use port 9100, which is open to TCP, to allow me to see that. The five different attacks down the side will describe different attacks on um, ping attacks that you can do on network discovery. You can do your SIN or your ACK on TCP, you can do a connection, you can check the UDP, and then you can do what we call a Christmas attack where we essentially throw in all of the flags, everything lights up like a Christmas tree, and um, explains to you all of those different options there. So by running the Xmas attack or the Christmas attack, um, it hands in all of those flags being turned on. So network discovery using Nmap is a really, really important tool. On the next side is our vulnerabilities. We want to use our network discovery to find out what vulnerabilities exist. It's really important for you to understand the different port usages and why they are used. If you see that 22 is open, you should be able to think immediately, secure shell is open. Cool. How can I use that? 21 and 22 are FTP, Telnet being 23. SMTP is 25, DNS 53, so on and so forth. HTTP of 80 is usually open, and so is 443, because 443 is secure HTTPS, and if you have a web server running on your computer, those two ports are going to be open. But that also means if I run scan on your network, and I see that 80 and 443 are open, I know there's a web server running on your computer. Hmm, which web server is it? Is it Apache? Can I take some advantage of some vulnerabilities in Apache by using those ports being open, by knowing that they're open. Now, 
It's running a web server. They have to be open because the point is to be able to run the web server. But if you're lucky, you created your, or if you're smart, you created your web server behind a DMZ in some sort of a um, segmented network so that even if someone can get into your web server, they can't get into the rest of your internal network. Having a memorization of at least these port numbers, there's only, I don't know, 20 or so listed here, um, that you really should have memorized. They, they should be in your head that every time someone says 110, you should say POP3, like it just is. Um, the same way that when you say four plus five, you say nine, and it just, you, you recognize these pretty instantly when you see them because for the purposes of vulnerability, I need to know which ports correlate to which services. Now using your Nmap tools is going to also help you to determine what those different um, ports are used for. So not having them entirely memorized won't be a really bad thing, but it still should be something that you recognize and you're pretty comfortable with. Our web vulnerability scan is usually done by a program called Nessus. Nessus is a free tool that is out there, which means it's free for you for testing. It's also free for the bad guys. It's designed to look at functionality of web application and look for the individual um, vulnerabilities therein. Are there things about your web server that are designed in a way that makes it in a, in a dangerous state? Is there something vulnerable about it? So being comfortable with the Nessus Web Scanner is, again, another tool you want to put into your toolbox. And our last vulnerability scan is our database vulnerability scan. We want to be able to make sure that our database is safe. Most databases are designed to be protected from direct access. They're usually stored on a database server, and the only way to get into it is through a firewall. So it's stored behind a firewall. Hopefully the firewall is configured in such a way that your database is safe and no one can access it directly. However, a web application has to get through it to get the data out of the database, which means now there is a portal to get into the database. We can use the SQL map database scanning tool to be able to scan specific databases to make sure that they are either open to vulnerability or that they are protected therein. So again, another tool to throw into your tool chest is that SQL map database scanner tool. Now we're going to discuss our penetration testing or pen testing. Pen testing generally follows a basic concept of starting from planning, moving into your discovery tip phase, figuring out what we're going to do, um, discover the, the vulnerabilities, make the actual attack. From the attack, either turn around and do more discovery or immediately report on the results of the attack. The Metasploit framework executes exploits against targeted systems using scripting. So there's a huge amount of scripts that are out there that will exploit vulnerabilities against these target systems. And you can do those while you're doing your penetration testing. Again, Metasploit is used by the hackers as well as by penetration testers. We all use the same tools. So recognizing that if your Metasploit attack can get through, so can the bad guys. When we run tests, we follow one of three different types of tests. White box testing is where the attacker actually has detailed information about the system. Either he ran through some vulnerability tests, he figured out which sources are on there, which ports were open. There's already some detailed information about the system. Maybe he did some social engineering to find some user accounts, information like that. So there's some detailed systems in there. Black box testing implies that he has absolutely no knowledge about your system at all. And then we're going to test based on lack of any knowledge, and we will only get information from those tests. Gray box is kind of a balance between the two. You may have some knowledge of the system. You know there's a web server running. You know there's a database in the back end. Um, you know that the database might be SQL Server, but you don't know which version. You know that it's running Linux, but you don't know which version, and you know that it's probably running Apache some knowledge, but not a huge amount of knowledge, and definitely not insider knowledge. We can use the breach and attack simulations, which is an automation that is designed to inject a threat indicator, so we do something, for the purposes of making sure that there is a response. We want to trigger that response. So we want to breach the system and attack, and then see that response. If the response doesn't happen, then we did something wrong. We need that response to say, yes, the, automation, the, the, the system is prepared, because if we inject our threat indicator into the system and we attack and there's no consequence, then we know that's an attack that we need to prevent against. We also need to make sure that we are in compliance. Big part of penetration testing is documentation. Everything needs to be documented to show that every control that we defined in our 
business continuity plan, in our um, testing, in our assessment controls to make sure that all of that is documented and make sure all those controls are working. When you build software, you have to test it. There is a part of testing software that involves writing the software in such a way that you test it continuously. So the thing about software, software tends to have privileged access to the operating system, maybe the hardware, the memory resources. Software has some power. And it also can handle really sensitive information. Just because you write the software to mask out your credit card number or your social security number doesn't mean that the information isn't in there. So if the information is in there and it's just being masked on the client side, then there's some sensitive information that you need to also protect. Software applications tend to rely on databases. The databases may contain the sensitive information. So if you have an application that is running and it's not doing anything sensitive, but it is getting stuff from the database, the database has sensitive information in it. So if someone can break into your system, use your system to attach to the database and then get information out of the database, you can use that database to get the information. So even though you may have a, a pretty simple website that's just showing public facing, everything's available to the public, there's no login, but there is a section where you could run against the database, that might be a problem. And the databases store the data, which means they tend to be the heart or the main part of all of your business critical functions. You can't run your business without the database in a lot of cases. So it's important to test your software because the software has access to the database, which is really, really important. When I write software, I always explain to my students that I never expect the user to behave correctly. The, beha the user is never going to do exactly what you expect him to do. So if I tell the user to type in the name of his client, um, and his client's name is Charles, and it's in the database is Charles, and he writes the name Charlie, it's going to throw everything off. I never expect my users to behave correctly. I don't expect them to do exactly what I want them to do. So I have to control them to an extent. I have to limit what they can enter. I have to use input validations. I have to use drop-down boxes rather than text-based entry. Different things to make sure that the user does what I want them to do without breaking my code. However, I can't control everything. So programmers use a concept called exception handling. Exceptions should be exceptional, which means they should not happen every day. But when you do have an exception, you need to handle it, which means you need to do something so that your code doesn't blow up. We call that exception handling. And in the example here in, I believe this is Java, um, we have a try catch block, which is a section that says we are going to take this piece of code and we are going to try it. We're going to do something to try it. And if it doesn't work, we are going to catch the exception. We call it throwing an exception. When something bad happens, we throw the exception. And so the other half of that is to catch it. We catch the exception with a try catch block. We're going to try something. If something bad happens, it will throw an exception at us. We will catch it and we will handle it. In the example here, we are trying to divide by zero. You can't divide by zero. The world explodes. So if you try to divide by zero, we catch the divide by zero exception and say, you tried to divide by zero. You can't do that. And then we keep running our code. We handled it. You know, just like the, the parent handling their, their inappropriate child, we are handling it and making sure that the code can continue to run smoothly without any breaking and without any loss of confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Once we have finished writing our code, and of course, we always test our code as we're going, but sometimes things don't always get caught. So we do two different things in code called code reviews and code testing. So code reviews involve planning the, the code review, overviewing it, preparing, inspecting individual lines of code, fixing the things that are wrong, and then following up when we're finished. A code review is done by your peers. So it has to be a person who understands how the code works. So it has to be a programmer or someone who is aware of how programming works. And then the programmer who has designed that section of code can stand in front of the group and say, this line of code does this, and this line of code does this, and this line of code does this, and this is what I was thinking when I wrote this, and this method does that, so on and so forth. By explaining in front of a crowd, essentially not a crowd, but a group of your peers, what the code is supposed to do, your peers can look at it and go, hmm, well, that's that's interesting, but you could have done it this way, or perhaps it's more efficient to do it that way, or why is this random allow user ABC to come in any time? Oh, that's right. I added that for my testing purposes. You're right. I need to take that out. Make sure that when you describe all the things that, that people do, that it's documented, that we go in and we fix anything that needs to be fixed, 
and then we follow up when we're all finished and show that it's been fixed. So code reviews are a big part of writing any software. Your application security testing can be one of three different types of testing. We call them static, dynamic, and fuzz testing. Understanding the difference between the three, again, is a big part of understanding application testing. Static testing, or static application security testing, if you want the acronym, S-A-S-T, is evaluating without running the app by looking at the source code. Again, similar to a code review. We are looking through the source code, looking for a if 2 plus 2 equals 5, then do this. Well, 2 plus 2 is never going to equal 5, so that should never happen. Um, if your login name is John, give yourself administrative privileges. Yeah, that's probably not good either. We can just look through the code and find pieces of code that look like this and say that's probably not safe. Let's change that. Let's do something else. So static testing is done without running the app. The app is not running. You are looking through the code individually. Dynamic testing DAST is run by running the app. We don't have any access to the source code. We are just running the app and we are trying to figure out if the app is running. Dynamic testing is where you use the app as you would normally use it, making the normal mistakes that you would normally make and see if you break it. Always a good thing to know if you break it before you release it into production. And fuzz testing, which is the concept of adding random input like the fuzzy screen from the TVs of the 70s. So fuzz testing is where it's random input, a bunch of zeros, a bunch of ones, random ones and zeros, um, which is intended to stress the system, try to make the system break from just too much work, and to find undetected flaws. If I was going to put in a birth date and I put in 01010101010101, it should break. That shouldn't work. Or should it? Is that a problem? If it was random input in there, is it going to do something that I want? Is there somewhere where it says, take the date of birth or the date of the invoice and then subtract 30 from it to find out whether the invoice is late or not and then issue a, a benefit based on that or so a, a penalty or some other cost and I put in the date of the invoice as some random information, is that gonna break the system? Under fuzz testing, we have two different versions of fuzz testing. We call it dumb and intelligent. So mutation fuzzing, Mutation to mutate to change uses prior input values and then just changes it. So if I'm going to take a birth date of 1 1, I don't know, 2000, and I'm going to change it and I'm going to make it 0 0 2001, is that going to break? So I'm going to use prior input values and change them and see if changing information or putting in random information on um, using prior input values is going to make changes. So mutation of previous values. First time I ran all ones, second time I ran all zeros. It's pretty basic. We're not doing anything intelligent. Generational fuzzing or intelligent fuzzing is where as you're doing the fuzz testing, you're actually developing a data model. So from your fuzz testing point of view, you can start to figure out what the data model is in the back of the database. If you can develop what the database model is from the back of the database from fuzz testing, so can the bad guy. So if the bad guy can come in and he can figure out what your database looks like, how your columns are created, how your data is seg segmented by using fuzz testing to build data models, that can give him more information. Again, the more information he gets, the stronger he is, the more power he has. We also like to do interface testing. So interface testing interface or tests the interface of either your API or your UI. So an API, Applicational Programming Interface, is the actual modules that are exposed to the outside world. Anybody can use those modules. So we need to make sure that the API is tested really well because we know that the outside world is going to be using those modules. The UI or user interface or graphical user interface, which I call a GUI, um, and command line interface also need to be tested to make sure that things don't go unnoticed. If you put in random information, if you put in something, are you getting back the information you expected to? And physical interfaces are a little bit more, in some cases, important. If you are writing a piece of software or you're writing some code or something and it is interacting with the real world, so a logic controller or an FPGA or a Cicada device or something like that, when you screw something up in that situation, there are real world changes to machinery. Settings get changed, logic controllers get changed, and that can cause some really damaging things. It's not just loss of data anymore. We can be talking about physical changes. If you have a device that is keeping track of your insulin and it 
has something that will give you extra insulin if it's if it thinks that your insulin is too low and it's broken and so it gives you more insulin than you should have that can be a significant problem so anything that has a physical interface physical as in the real world needs to be tested for misuse testing we always need to prepare for the users to misuse the application for example in a bank account attempting to access a different account so this is my account one two three four i'm going to try to attack uh, um, withdraw from one two three three is that can that happen can i do that if i try to withdraw money from an overdrawn account can i do that does it just let my account go to negative is that okay or does it actually stop me from withdrawing the money this is different and very personal for every individual app you have. Each app has its own ways that someone is going to misuse it. And there's no set list of always check this. Every application you need to look at and figure out how can your users misuse this? What information could they obtain if they wanted to misuse this? And if an actual attacker was using your system to try to get information, how would he do that? So you need to think about that with misuse testing and how can you prepare for that. Over time, when you're writing software, you are going to develop lots and lots of tests. And it's very rare that you are going to run all of the tests all of the time. You're very rarely going to have 100% test coverage. Most of the time, you're going to cover different types of tests or different segments of the test every time something runs through a test system. So if I have, say, 100 different tests and I'm going to test 40 of them, I have a 40% test coverage. Number of test cases tested and total number of cases, just simply running it as a percentage. When we talk about test coverage, we talk about different types of test coverage, such as your branch coverage. Anytime that there is a branch between an if and an else. So if, if I have code that runs if x equals 5, go do this. Otherwise, go do that. I now have a branch condition. I need to test both x equaling 5 and x not equaling 5. I might need to test x is less than 5 and x is greater than 5 and x is 0 to make sure that all of them work. But those are branch coverage. Conditional coverage tests every logical test, which could kind of be thought of as a branch coverage, but it's really any case where we're running a type of logical question, a Boolean expression of some type. Are we running through every logical condition that could possibly occur? When we write code, we break it up into functions. So you need to test every function. If I give you this input, it, do I get the correct output? And you can build hundreds of functional tests against your function. So if my function was an adder that was going to add two numbers, well, okay, I'm going to add zeros, and I'm going to add one and two, and I'm going to add two and two, and I'm going to add three and four, and I'm going to add 26 and 42. I'm going to add some negative numbers because I don't want to forget those. I'm going to add some, you know, irrational numbers and see if it breaks, so on and so forth. So with your function, you want to definitely test your functions. Loop coverage, you always want to check any loop. So anything that says do this 10 times, do this until the user quits. Any type of a do while loop or a for loop, you want to check your loop coverage. And you always want to check that the loop only happens once, that the loop happens multiple times, and that the loop doesn't happen at all. A lot of times people will put in a loop condition and not realize that it will never actually be called. And they'll just run through the code saying, if you run into this case, you'll go do this beautiful loop and something great will happen. But wait, the case never doesn't occur at the beginning, so it never happens. Always check your loop coverage. And finally, your statement coverage. Make sure when you walk through your code that every single line of your code has been called. If you have a line of code that has not been called, why is the line of code in there? Unless it's a comment, which is fine, but is a line of a statement of code, make sure that every line has been executed at least once. Otherwise, that code is never being used and it is a waste of space. Don't put it in there. It's just a confusion. Along with that, we want to make sure that we monitor our website. So different ways of monitoring our website. We can use passive monitoring, which is where we actually just sit back and we watch real-time network traffic. We call this real user monitoring, and it's designed to really track the interaction that a user has with the application. What is the user doing? Well, he goes from this page to that page. He clicks in this. He does that. What are we doing to see what the user is actually doing in real time? Passive monitoring isn't a um, assessment of what's going on as much as just watching. Like we aren't doing anything actively. We are sitting back and we are watching users use the system. 
Synthetic monitoring, also called active monitoring to contrast with passive, is where you are actively putting in artificial transactions to assess the performance. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit my database with 20 different transactions and make sure that they all run perfectly. Um, I am actively doing something to monitor my website. I'm gonna go to the page, I'm gonna click on every link. I'm going to make sure that the website works the way it's supposed to. Once we wanna start our security management process, we need to do a couple of things. First, we're gonna make sure we do log reviews. So logs are boring. Most of the time they say absolutely nothing useful. They say, John logged in, John logged out, John logged in again, they're boring. And a lot of people, get logs, but they never actually look at them. You have to make yourself do an, a, a log review. Now you can use automated processes to log review and only show you the things that jump out and say, oh look, John tried to log in 17 times with the wrong password. So log reviews can be automated, but they need to be completed. You can also manually log review, like actually look through the log and find the answers. Some companies will employ a SIEM -E process or a security information and event management process, which is a piece of software that is going to keep track of all of your logs and make sure that your security is set. Um, these kind of programs will collect all of their data from all the different sources, aggregate it, so munge it up and find counts and find sums and find averages, so on and so forth. Then it will discover threats and then it will identify the security breaches from those processes. It's a piece of software that generally costs something, so it isn't for everybody, but it is really useful for helping your security team to find those alerts without having to manually search through logs every day. But it is important to always conduct log reviews, especially for things like sensitive functions, functions that are, you know, approving or disapproving, functions that are that are doing pieces of information that are important. Um, or access privilege. You always want to check your access privilege and make sure that people don't have that privilege create coming in. We also want to make sure we do account management, ensuring that uh, unauthorized changes to permissions don't occur. Did something change to what I am allowed to view? Why? And was there a reason? Oh, yeah, because you started a new project and you had to do, you know, you had to have new permissions to a new folder. That makes sense. But was it authorized? As long as it was authorized, you're fine. If it wasn't authorized, then hey, why do you have access to an account that you shouldn't have access to? For highly privileged accounts, you should definitely do a full review of all accounts at least once a year, maybe once every quarter. Full reviews of accounts take time. To do a full review, you essentially take the system and ask the system, what are all the privileges that John has? Cool. Then you go find John's boss and say, hey, John's boss, what permissions should John have? And John's boss says, here are the privileges that he should have. And you look at the list of privileges from the system and you make sure they match. And if there are more privileges in the system than the privileges that John should have, there has been privilege creep or something nefarious has occurred. So you always want to be careful with reviews, um, list of privileges from what you should have and list of privileges from what you actually do have and make sure that they match. This can take time. So again, you may not want to do this with every employee, but you will definitely want to do this with every employee eventually. So you might want to say, okay, we're going to do highly privileged accounts once a month, and we are going to do every employee at least once a year divided into twelfths. So A through C gets done in January, and then so on and so forth. But you do want to have some sort of review of your accounts to make sure that there has been no privilege creep and that everything should be in order. We have an entire lesson on disaster recovery and business community planning, but to just touch on those, disaster recovery planning is where we create a checklist and plans for the exact procedures that are going to be followed in the event of a disaster for the purposes of recovering our entire system. Business continuity planning, in the same sense, is figuring out what is the necessary function business functionality and processes required to make sure that the company can continue to run and how to get that functionality back up in order using risk analysis as fast as possible. So sometimes those aren't always the same thing. A disaster recovery could be making sure that in the event of an earthquake that we have food and water and that everybody gets out of the building and that we have the backup tapes. Business continuity planning can be make sure that we have backup tapes and that we have a hot site available to use those backup tapes to be able to restart our system as soon as possible. They're similar and there's a huge amount of overlap, but um, again, there's a full lecture on both of those. Training and awareness is always important because security is everyone's business and everyone's responsibility in the company.
We need to have recurrent training throughout the year. We need to do some fishing simulations. We need to do things to make sure that the people in the company are aware of their role as the security awareness of our company. And our last section refers KPIs, key performance indicators and risk indicators. KPIs, kind of a buzzword these days. However, they are actually a really good useful thing. We need to measure. We need to have a number that defines something. They're a way of monitoring our results from our testing to make sure that our security posture is actually getting better or as opposed to worse. So what we do is we look at different pieces of information. How many open vulnerabilities do we have? How long did it take to fix them? How many vulnerability and defects do we see popping up again and again? How many compromised accounts do we have this year? How many software flaws were detected in pre-production as opposed to being detected during development? We want to make sure that everything is clean by the time you get to pre-production. So if we found security flaws in pre-production, we need to fix our development team so that they fix those earlier. When we do audits, do we want to re have repeat audit findings? Like the audit said, you messed up here. And then a year later, hey, you're still messing up here. We need to document all of these. We need to have numbers to associate so that we can graph them and visualize them to see, are we meeting the success things that we need? So following your KPIs or your key performance indicators or risk indicators is a really important way of documenting your security assessment and vulnerabilities and making sure that over time your company is getting better as opposed to worse in their security posture. So as a summary, for your CISSP exam, it's important that you understand the importance of security assessments and testing. How do you conduct vulnerability assessments and penetration tests? How do you use Nmap? How do you use Nessus? How do you use Metasploit? How do you use the different softwares that are available out there? When you're doing software testing, make sure you understand development, pre-production, and production testing, understand the difference between static, dynamic, and fuzz testing, all in part of software. For security management, you need to understand about log reviews and account management and your key performance indicators. Security audits, the different audit types and different audit programs, internal, external, and third party, and a collection of the entire security process. You need to understand how are you ensuring that your security process, including documentation throughout, is being protected and secured throughout your company. Thanks for watching this lesson on CISSP's Chapter 15, Security Assessment and Testing. Have a great day.